Once upon a time. Welcome to Australian Book Lovers. Your destination for imagination. And it's a big warm welcome to everyone with a huge thank you for joining us for the Australian Book Lovers podcast, episode 47. Our mission is to bring fabulous Australian and Indigenous literature that spans a whole range of genres to book lovers around the globe, as well as fantastic resources and information for passionate authors looking to write their next bestseller. I'm Veronica Strachan, aka VE Pattern, fantasy, memoir and picture book writer, reader and one of your co-founders and hosts for the podcast tonight, coming to you from Wauron country in Victoria. And I am Darren Kazanko, dystopian science fiction and horror author, avid reader and one of your co-hosts and co-founder of the Australian Book Lovers podcast. Coming to you today, of course, Veronica, you know what I'm going to say, straight yep. from corner country. <laughs> Indeed, yes. And I said tonight, but of course, you know, it doesn't have to be night when you're listening. We just happens to be night when we're recording. That's right. Yes, it's a uh, day, night. Our podcast is eternal. Yes. <laughs> yes. And speaking of <laughs> and the eternal, wonders of modern technology, you know, I just think it podcasting is amazing and audiobooks are amazing and the fact that you can read at any time of the day or night without a torch under the covers, which I used to do as a child because I had to turn the light off. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Uh, the, the, the the Kindles with the uh, paper white with, with the light were fantastic because the original Kindle, the first Kindle I had, uh, was, it wasn't lit up. It didn't. Right. So you, you could buy like clip on little lamps, which was, mm -hmm. I, I always thought it was a little bit strange. All this powerful technology and it didn't have a light. And then, of course, the, the paper whites came out and uh, with the light. So, yes, you're absolutely right. You can hide in the dark and then next thing you know you can be swept away by a uh, awesome book but just in digital form that's uh the yeah. words are the same the letters are the same the sentences are the same but i know there's people that swear that they uh would they rather have the smell of the paper and and i agree there's nothing like that beautiful feeling of a good book in your hand but the uh, smell of books is fantastic i could spend days just walking around both new bookshops and old bookshops, although the old ones have that particular history in them. Absolutely, they do. And yes, they're getting fewer and far between now, but you're right, a good, uh, well, new new bookshops are fun, but yeah, when you find one of those uh, good secondhand bookshops that's been there for 20, 20 plus years and, you know, where there's books stacked on top of books or stacked on top of books. And uh, I think, I'm, I think, I don't know if it was mentioned on the podcast, but uh, I know I'm pretty sure I've spoken to you about it when I was living on the Gold Coast and there's a secondhand bookshop there and it was uh, literally overflowing. You know, you're virtually walking over books to get through the door, mm -hmm. but you could say a title or a particular genre like, oh, there's a book. So I think it's about this or that to this lady and she'll sort of stare at you for a minute and go, yes, I know where that is. <laughs> and then boom, 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 you follow her through the maze and then yeah. eventually she'll go look up and down and go, here it is. Yeah. And it was absolutely mind boggling. And it was just a treat to go in and, and see that. So, yes, very cool. I know their books. Oh, yes, they do indeed. And uh, we're slowly getting to know our podcast too. And this is episode number 47. Yes. How good is that now? It's pretty good. I have to say, Darren. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's, uh, yeah, we're definitely getting there. And of course, I've had a bit of a look into what n number 47 means. Um, of course you have. Tell yeah, us about it. I might be getting a little bit addicted to uh, this phenomenal, <laughs> um, shall we say, Beyond science uh, so, descriptions yeah, of numbers. a little bit of numerology. And this one's, I'll, I'll put a little twist in this one. Uh, well, I didn't put a twist in it. I discovered a little bit of a twist. But uh, 47 apparently is a spiritual and mystical number that angels send to us to congratulate for all the progress that we've made on our spiritual path. So now it's also an angel number that acts as an encouragement to keep putting in an effort in deepening your spiritual experience. Not too bad, yes, 47. Mm -hmm. um, I had this bit, there's a few reasons to contemplate. Now, <laughs> uh, interesting enough, I also saw that in the Bible, the number 47, the uh, symbolism for the numbers 47 comes from, as you guessed it, the numbers four and seven. Very, uh, I hope everyone can follow me there, so I haven't lost <laughs> anyone there yet. <laughs> now, whereby four represents God's righteousness and seven represents both spiritual and physical perfection. 
So obviously on the fourth day, uh, God created the sun, the moon and the stars, which are all symbols of truth in life. And the creation ended on the seventh day, symbolizing that everything was perfect and nothing more needed to be added. However, the book of Revelation also talks about seven trumpets announcing the rapture. So just when you thought it was all good. So I say, therefore, number 47 is a symbol of both righteousness and perfection in life. I would say more that it may be a duality because if four is uh, talking about beginnings, you know, creation, and seven is the trumpets, which I don't really think symbolizes uh, beginnings. Well, a beginning of something, but it definitely symbolizes the end of something. Uh, maybe 47 is duality and then f that would represent uh yeah yourself and myself being part of a duality doing the podcast possibly possibly yeah <laughs> i think that's a bit of a stretch i was thinking more like you know seven you started about trumpeters and then i went straight to seven swans are swimming and then that would be four geese are laying so there's geese mm. and swans and birds and yeah yeah no no yeah i kind of got a bit lost there Yes, yes. But I mean, the uh, numerology packages are for very small amounts. I'll do a reading for numbers. That'll be coming to the <laughs> website soon. No, no, it won't. No. It will not but be coming soon. I do want to share with you a little bit about the smell of books. So, Oh, yes. I've just done this, you know, very quick research. So people smell books because old books smell good. And there are a few scientific and non-scientific reasons. And, you know, Lots of people are trying to classify the smell of books and they're saying that they smell like coffee and chocolate and those things. However, the smell of books uh, uh, is made up of paper, adhesive and ink. And while those materials degrade over time, they give off organic volatile compounds, which in turn produce the smell, which is what appeals to readers. The reason it's so appealing, they say, is because it has a hint of vanilla. And the scientific explanation for the vanilla-ish scent is that almost all wood-based paper contains lignin, which is closely related to vanillin. So there you go. So that's number one. There is chemistry. The second is that it's a remembrance of things past. So the smell of the books might actually remind you of things. And the olfactory bulb is part of the brain's limbic system. See, we're getting all medical all over again, which is kind of handy for our guests later. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, this is a, so the limbic system is associated with memories and feelings. And so that when you first smell a new scent, your brain links the smell with an event, a person, a thing, or a moment. And so that if you smell that thing again, your brain conjures up the memory. And while it might not always be explicit, it could just be an emotion, you know, like a fragrance of somebody that, you know, was always kind to you or um, that was mean to you or all those kind of things. And thirdly, books remind people of all good things. So this is utterly unscientific and a sweeping generalization, according to this author. <laughs> Books are absolutely best smelling things in the world because they appeal, or because books appeal to explicit and implicit memory. So they, you know, remind people of the wonderful moments they've experienced, uh, when they felt emotionally good. Um, some uh, people have had books so they make them feel calm and safe. They're a sanctuary. They remind them of their school library. All sorts of things of why the smell of books makes you feel good. So there you go. Three little reasons. Yeah, fascinating. And uh, I wonder too if it's perhaps you know being book lovers that we are, uh, the smell of a good book is the is a, is a promise. So yes. it, it, it's a, like a, I, I guess that Pavlov, you know, with the, the ringing of the bell, if you smell the yeah. book, you know that, hoo, 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 get, get to read a really cool book. So, yeah. uh, but it's interesting you say vanilla. There's definitely mm. not, I, I mean, I would have described books as, especially secondhand books and a simple description most would use for a secondhand bookshop would be musty. Yeah. You know, but the, the books themselves, I would, I've always sort of felt they smell a little bit earthy in a strange yes. way. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, I guess maybe what well, I'll, obviously originally made of wood uh, yes. and maybe it's that reminder of that uh, yeah of something earthy but it's interesting that it's a smell that you you know it could go on debate for years because mm. there's no one or two words to do it and it reminds no, me it's very subjective yeah and i think it's very similar to a certain soft drink um that once had cocaine in it of course ah. coca-cola <laughs> because it's interesting you know when it's, mm. it's on the same sort of playing field when it comes to taste i still haven't had anybody tell me what coke tastes like 
you know, mm. I've, I've drunk it plenty of times, but I couldn't tell you what it tastes like. Mm. What, what does it taste like? I know what Sunkiss tastes like, but oh, okay. <laughs> Coke is that elusive, uh, you know, I suppose the only un true answer is it tastes like chemicals, but it's bubbly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it I, is I'm funny. I'm not a soft drink um, aficionado, so I probably couldn't say. But that makes me think of the Matrix where the, the young fellow says, what does chicken taste like? You know, is this chicken? Uh, who said it tastes like chicken? Ah, uh, yeah, then things get slippery there. It becomes very slippery, yes. I, I, I'd recently saw on some uh, tech devices, and one of them is a special drinking bottle, mm. which comes with, speaking of olfactory and uh, our senses through our nose, it's uh, with a special little design for the mouthpiece, but it has a slot where you can put cartridges in. And essentially, so for example, if you put the strawberry cartridge in, <laughs> when you drink your and you, you just put pure water in there but when you drink the water you'll be convinced you're for example drinking strawberry milk mm. um but, and it does that by sending putting a, a scent in your nose as you're drinking mm. so you can turn your water into just about any flavor you want and by tricking yourself with this water bottle so yeah there we go Fine. There you all, go. all roads lead to pretend strawberry milkshakes <laughs> in the year 2022 uh, so. but what about roads leading to some news absolutely let's jump into some news for episode 47 da -da 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 -da. i have some local news to share and i wanted to share it because unfortunately i'm not able to attend but this is the Mountain Riders Festival, and they are running a lunch with Tony Birch, Evelyn Araluen, Tom Griffiths, and Sophie Cunningham. And look, it's just so fantastic. I definitely would have gone uh, if I had been in Victoria, but I'm going to be in South Australia in corner country, but there you go. So yes, the, Mountain, you will. <laughs> the Mountain Riders Festival lunch is on March 26th from 12 till 4 p.m. up at the Wine Collective uh, in Macedon. And it's a conversation with four absolutely remarkable Australian riders discussing the intersection of story and place in our fragile natural world. So Tony Birch uh, is the author of three novels, the best-selling The White Girl Ghost River, which won the Victorian Premier's Literary Award for Indigenous Writing, and Blood, which was shortlisted for the Miles Franklin. He's also the author of Shadow Boxing and three short story collections, Father's Day, The Promise and Common People. And in 2017, he won the Patrick White Literary Award. Evelyn Arrow Lewin, uh, the author of Drop Bear, is a poet, researcher and co-editor of Overland Literary Journal. Her widely published criticism, fiction and poetry have been awarded the Nakata Brophy Prize for Young Indigenous Writers, the Judith Wright Poetry Prize, which is a Wheeler Centre Next Chapter Fellowship, and the Neilma Sydney Literary Fund Travel Grant. She was born and raised on Darug Country and she's a descendant of the Bunjalung Nation. Tony mm. Griffiths is a historian whose books and essays have won prizes in literature, history, science, politics, and journalism. His books include Hunters and Collectors, Forests of Ash, and Environmental History, Slicing the Silence, Voyaging to Antarctica, one of our places, favourite places, Darren, you and I, Living with Fire and the Art of Time Travel, Historians and Their Craft, and he writes for Inside Story with Griffiths Review, Mianjin and Australian Book Review, and he is the Emeritus Professor of History at the Australian National University and has lived in the Macedon Ranges since 2018. Not nearly as long as me, but that's okay. Uh, Sophie Cunningham. Sorry? <laughs> I said, who's counting? Who's counting? That's right. That's important. Sophie Cunningham, she is the author of seven books, including City of Trees, Essays on Life, Death and the Need for a Forest. What a great title for a book. She's also a teacher, a mentor, a climate change activist, a wildlife advocate, and every day she posts an image of a tree on her Instagram, which is at Soph Tree of Day. Her novel, This Devastating Fever, is uh, coming out with Ultimo Press in September 2022, and she's begun researching a new non-fiction book, The Time Machines, in search of 10 of Australia's oldest and most remote trees. 
So how about that for a group of people to have lunch with? Yeah, that does sound pretty awesome. Yeah. It does sound pretty awesome. So jump onto their website, which is mountainwritersfestival.com.au and you can look forward slash events uh, and you can hear all about the team who are putting it together, about the ambassadors uh, who are John Marsden, who has lived in the area for a long time, and Sally Rippon, even though so she was born in Darwin, but she's uh, also a local now. And yeah, book yourself a ticket and then ring me or email me and tell me how good it was and <laughs> I should have stayed in Victoria. Send a postcard. <laughs> Send me a postcard. <laughs> well, we were talking before uh, the, before hitting the record button and, and talking about the possibility of maybe doing uh, quote unquote live recording with the both of us in the same place. Yes. Uh, maybe in one of the beautiful wineries of McLaren Vale. So whether it be McLaren Vale or whether we do it down the Fleur Peninsula somewhere or, or on the yeah. uh, top of a deep creek where you're looking down the coastline that will uh, take your breath away. I suspect you'll probably forget even how to spell Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we will see. <laughs> Although we were just looking at things to do on uh, Kangaroo Island and uh, snorkeling is definitely the go. Uh, Hubby has looked at a quad biking. He said, would you want to do that? I said, oh, no, I think I might find a massage or an art class or something. So we will do some together and some away oh. from each other. Yeah, well, KO, I think, is all about the exploring. I mean, it's, yeah. I think it's, it's you know, the second or third largest island in Australia. Mm, so, some don't know yet. Islands. I haven't done yeah. my, all my research. But lots of wildlife. And I believe the author that you interviewed for today's episode there's a bit of wildlife, one of your favourite Australian mm -hmm. animals. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to have a, a, a super fun, sorry, a super fun interview. I was going to say super fun episode. We're already in the middle of the super fun episode. No, we're <laughs> going to have a super fun interview with author CJ Timms or Chris Timms uh, and to discuss, well, amongst other things, his book, The Aussie Manor Apocalypse, book one, which is mm. a lit RPG novel. But that will be soon because first I wanted to just do a quick spotlight on a couple of brand new additions to the website. Excellent. Tell so Starting okay. with, no, I'm going to finish with one that I think will have you salivating as well. Mm. Uh, but I'll start with one that is a new addition to our young adult genre. Mm -hmm. And it is, the title is called Legend of the Winged Lion. And it is by author Cheryl Berman. Uh, really nice, stunning little cover too. Now, Legend of the Winged Lion reads, A diamond tumbles into a chasm. Lightning arcs across a starlit sky. A forgotten evil wakes. Bears and wolves race to the mountains in frenzied obedience to the evil's command. Transformed into monstrous creatures, they lay siege to the caverns of the High Alps, home of the Slay and Griffin. Elise's destiny is to be a powerful Slay seer, but when the evil touches her, she must battle its whispered promises, or see her world destroyed by her own hand. In her village, Guare, I hope I pronounced that right, <laughs> scrubs pots and dreams of her mother's wistful stories of wise beings and magical flying beasts. But when the evil threatens her people, she discovers dreams can hold the key to victory. Mm. And that is Legend of the Winged Lion by Cheryl Berman. Mm -hmm. I suspect there's a bit of a fantasy element there too, especially um, I can identify fantasy often by very, very tricky names to pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we do like to invent the names. But, yeah. yeah, no, <laughs> but it looks great. So if that sounds like something you'd like to uh, learn more about, then jump onto our young adult page or young adult genre page. Um, now, slipping down a little bit to middle grade, a mm -hmm. little bit of a younger audience, we've got a brand new edition, uh, and that is called The Bravest Word, and by none other than Kate Foster, author yes. of Pause. And The Bravest Word, and that, this too has a really nice cover, actually. Um, I really like the play, the, the, uh, the mood, that the, the different blues in that sort of conjure, so I'll let the audiences, if they want to uh, see what I'm talking about, then I'm not just losing my mind on a, uh, <laughs> a, a, a surprisingly hot day. No, so it is a beautiful cover, The Bravest Word, and it reads, do you hear that? You're Cliff now, and your life is going to get better, I promise. When 11-year-old Matt finds Cliff, a hurt, neglected dog abandoned in the bush, he knows the brave little pup needs saving. He wants to help, but can he? Lately, Matt has had way more bad days than good days. The pieces of his life just don't seem to fit together anymore, and he doesn't understand why. He's finding it impossible to concentrate at school and has lost interest in the activities he used to love. 
Plus, he's tired all the time. Matt's too afraid to share what's really going on in his own head with anyone. His friends and family will never understand. Maybe it's not only Cliff who needs saving. And that is The Bravest Word mm. by Kate Foster, author of Pause. Um, Excellent. Yeah, sounds like a little bit of a heartwarming tale there. Yeah, and, and uh, we will be chatting to Kate. Uh, she's on our list of authors who, uh, yeah, uh, not too far away at all. Not too far away. I'm yeah, just going to say, yeah, not promising times. So that's just saying, not too far away. <laughs> no, I no, like literally, not, yeah, literally not too far away. So it's really good. Very exciting. Yeah. Um, and how, who can't love uh, stories that involve paws? Yeah. And, and floppy ears and uh, yeah and the, yeah, I, I definitely I implore people to have a look at the cover. It's a real nice cover, and you'll find that under our middle grade genre, uh, which of course is the possum swinging from a monkey bar mm -hmm. or monkey ladder, shall we say? Now, for the other book that I like to spotlight, a, a brand new addition to our science fiction genre is, and I hope I pronounced this right, <laughs> Astraeus. And Astraeus is written by Callan J. Mulligan. Now, Astraeus by Callan J. Mulligan is a best selling sci fi thriller for fans of James S. A. Corey's The Expanse, Alex Garland's Sunshine, and Isaac Asimov's Foundation, and the like. On board, ah, yes. Good. I saw that come out and I thought, mm, The Expanse and Asimov, mm, so very it's a pretty, good. Yeah, pretty good way to sort of introduce it, isn't yeah. it? Far out. On board a world settling starship named the Astraeus, a colony adjusts to their new life in the stars as they embark on a 200 year journey to the center of the Milky Way. When a passenger is murdered, the colony begins to turn on each other and things get far worse when the ship begins to experience violent tremors. In a race against time, they must find answers and repair the damage or risk falling victims to the cold, empty void of space. And that is Astraeus by Callan J. Mulligan. Yeah, very cool. Um, yeah, and another fantastic cover too. Really like that. Yes, but I always thought, doesn't the centre of the Milky Way have a black hole? Um, don't know. It's been a long time since I did astronomy. Well, so the, of, our, of our star system, our, our uh, not solar system, is in our galaxy, I think. Well, but that, it is fiction, theory. after all, you know. Yeah, I know. Oh, no, no. I'm just, <laughs> I was just wondering, maybe it means that they go into the black hole. That made Ooh. me think of that movie, uh, Event Horizon. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's yeah. A, Good, good. Yeah, still a bit terrifying. But yes, yeah, what I mean, wow, when you're talking about, you know, for fans of The Expanse and Sunshine and Isaac Asimov. Yes, uh, I have just a, managed to complete my binge of The Expanse because the final, <gasps> that word, the final um, season, season six. But of course, there are more books in S.A. Corey's, uh, James S.A. Corey's Expanse. Um and I'm waiting. Whoever has the third book in the series out from the Gisborne Library, it was due back in December. Could you please <laughs> send it back because I'm waiting for it. <laughs> I can't read the next one until I finish the third one. Oh, <laughs> can't get it like airship from library to library? <laughs> no, I think I might have to take a little drive up to Bendigo. It's only an hour and go to uh, the bookshop up there and just buy the whole series secondhand. There oh, you there go. you go. Yeah, I did look at suggesting the children bought them for me for Christmas, but it's a really big series. So I think it was, you know, more than $100, which, yeah, I mean, I'm really happy to buy new books as well, but that was just a bit of a bridge too far. It is, it is a, um, well, it's a first world problem, but, but it is a book, <laughs> it is a book, as in a book lover's pro problem as well, because I know that when I'm on a reading binge, you know, especially if, depending on where I'm, you know, if I've got the time on commuting and stuff like that. Yeah. Two books a week's easy, maybe three. Mm. Uh, and if I was buying them new, that could be anything up to $120, $130 a week just mm. in books. Mm. I was joking to someone else. I think I'd, I'd, I'd crack addiction would probably be cheaper as far as uh, <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, I don't know, Darren. I think there are some, you know, long-term consequences. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hence my decision to stick with books. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but, uh, uh, but it's a... a from a personal you know perspective, I kind of love jiggling between all three. So I love you know going to the library and and, and yes. bringing the tower home and just yeah. having having one book in that room, one book in that room, and so I can you know my Netflix on the go reading wise. I love mm -hmm. going to a secondhand bookshop and picking up a couple of great titles, and then I love you know going and getting a new book, brand new book, yes. un untouched. So nothing better than you being the first one. Yeah, but, but also all, nothing better than than good. you being who else has read this book? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
yeah, each, each finding uh, old method. receipts in it that were people's bookmark and yeah. Or that little piece of paper that says "Help me," and then uh-oh, <laughs> when was that written? When was that written? Yeah. Well, see, so I get books in the library. I also get audio books from uh, the library. So when I walk, I'm either listen to a podcast or an audio book. Uh, only when I'm on my own, uh, and I have my own paperbacks or hard copies and my own tablet because I try not to read on the tablet at night so that you know it gives the eyes a, a rest from the blue screen and depending on which room I am or whether the batteries run out I often have four or five books on the go so yeah interesting so because I mean, let's for the sake of conversation let's assume each book mm-hmm. no matter what format it's in represents some form of event of adventure mm. so then it's kind of be st- it would kind of be true to say that on any given time when you go to read, you choose your own adventure. Yes. Which may uh, lead us in, and there's a very, very a uh, amateurish smooth segue. segue. Smooth, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll say very amateurish <laughs> to, uh, to welcome a discussion about our absolutely wonderful guest who we'll be talking to very shortly, uh, Mr. C.J. Timms, who, as, as I mentioned, wrote a book called The Aussie Man Apocalypse Book One, which is a lit RPG. Um, mm. Now, I know that the last episode you mentioned to look into, you challenged me to look into Choose Your Own Adventures. Yes, because uh, it's challenge was well accepted. after my time. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, the I think the last one was done in two, th- no, oh, I'm not, 2008. I don't know. I'll tell you in a sec. We'll find mm-hmm. out. Um, but I was also talking to clients that were re- heavily involved in Dungeons and Dragons or stream, mm. like actual creating stuff online for streaming. And that's going from I, strength to strength. That's yeah, not fading anywhere. Is no. It? And I asked, you know, just, just for people to say, oh, you know, what, what's really the difference between choose your own adventure and you know, role playing games? Um, and essentially, there's not much difference at all. Uh, it's all sort of the same format where. You know, a player or a reader um, has the outcome of the story. I guess is is dependent on the player, and sometimes it's dependent on luck. You know, if you whether you bring tools into it, i.e., cards or dice or stuff like that. So now I, I have I do not have much experience with Dungeons and Dragons. I have it in virtual reality, mm-hmm. but but that's just more fun. Um, but yeah, so it was really uh, interesting looking into choose your own adventures because essentially. You know, a role playing game is is that you know you have to decide, make decisions, and then those decisions, of course, have consequences. Unlike politicians in Australia, and then so that whether you use dice rolls or whatnot. Um, but I did look into the Choose Your Adventures because they were Excellent. such such a oh they were, they were just such a treasure when I was growing up. And I you know in the early eighties that was for, for a period there that was all you'd read was the choose your own adventures mm. as far as I was and you'd swap them with friends or sometimes you know you'd sit there and read the books out loud together essentially turning it into like a Dungeons and Dragons mm. and then mm. coming and you know deciding together you know do we go do we do this do we do that and then oh no we've got to fight the, the beast and okay well do you want to roll the dice oh no you roll the dice <laughs> um, so it was, it was super fun um, but you know, lit RPG, I think, has taken it to the next level. I, um, you know, because role playing games, you know, the digital world, I think, has just given it this whole brand new lease on life. And, and obviously, things evolve and start uh, ha- having amazing new features. But as far as where it all probably began, which, you know, really did begin with the Choose Your Own Adventures. I thought I might read a very brief history of Choose Your Own Adventure, which is very mm-hmm. short, but uh, quite, quite awesome. So. Oddly enough, they were called game books, which I didn't realise. But anyway, Choose Your Own Adventure game books began life in 1979 as the first publishing effort of a new division at Bantam Books focused on young readers. Now, the series of interactive game books initially had only uh, so-so sales until, and now you like this, until some genius in marketing had the idea to quote-unquote seed 100,000 books in libraries across the country. There you go. Now, overnight, the books became hugely popular. Mm. So between 1979 and 1999, the series sold over 250 million copies worldwide and was translated into 38 languages. So the original classic Choose Your Own Adventure series contained 184 game books authored by 30 different writers. The books were set in locations around the globe, in outer space, under the sea, and in a number of distinctly imagined fantasy worlds. 
Over the course of its publication, Choose Your Own Adventure featured every known literary genre. The mm. last new title in the original series was released by Bantam, uh, which by then had become a division of Random House, in 1998. I knew there was an eight in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are new books being continuously put out, but the original ones the, of the original Choose Your Own Adventure series or game books, basically the last one was in 1998. But yeah, can you believe it? Um, 250 million copies worldwide and you know 30 different writers in that original series and and just about every literary every known literary genre it's a it's quite interesting i think mm. we owe a lot to that little uh, birth of uh, roll the dice and choose left or right and so yeah. um, you know it's, it's it echoed through time and now plays a huge part in online gaming um, and obviously still in-person gaming i guess what do they call it table gaming uh, or mm. table versions uh, so yeah and while looking into it and just sort of reminiscing and it made me think it's, I can't see it being exactly easy writing a choose your own adventure no. because you, because if I remember correctly, you know, you would, there might be three ways to get to a certain point. Um, it's not, a, you wouldn't have just two distinct lines running off or three distinct pathways. Those pathways intersect because you'd have to do that for economics of writing. Would be very um, difficult for a pantser or a discovery writer, as it's called, like me. Uh, it would be almost impossible because things wouldn't add up and there'd be plot holes all over the place. So for somebody perhaps who really likes uh, plotting, uh, yeah, it might be a way to go, but still not easy. Well, I think that has inspired me because... I Are you going to write one? Two, two books to finish. Obviously, we we'll tidy up ours, and then I've, yes. I've got to finish Godless. Yes. Um, but I'm going to have time coming soon, a little bit mm. more time. Uh, but, yeah, I think a goal is definitely going to be in the background to put together a short Choose Your Own Adventure. Always one or two. And I'd love to be able to do it in audio format as well on mm. the web so that people can click. And, How would you uh, do that? Yeah. Yeah, we. Just, I'm going to sit down and work it out. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think the first thing I'm going to do is jump on eBay and try and find some of those classic '80s choose yeah. your own adventures and uh, have a good oh, read to see how they did it. Because I know uh, my kids did like them, so yeah, mind you, they're probably in boxes somewhere at my house. But anyway, mm, well, I can't call it choose your own adventure because that's registered trademark. So I'll no. come up with some Aussie slang like, is it uh, maybe have a crack, mate? No, no something. <laughs> 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 No, well, or, or interestingly, adventure. Uh, adventure is, of course, hardwired into the human psyche. So while you were chasing up the Choose Your Own Adventure, I was thinking, why is it that we like adventure? And neuroscience, psychology, and even anthropology all you know, distilled down to the point that humans are meant to seek adventure. Homo sapiens became the most world's most successful hominid in part because we migrated all over the globe and into nearly every possible ecosystem and you know in brackets parasites but that's us you know mm -hmm. uh, symbiotes whatever you like to say but the thirst for new exciting experience is part of our dna although of course you know some people crave it more than others and letting ourselves be the fun seeking exploratory animal that we are Pursuing adventures outside in particular can have big, even profound impacts on our otherwise citified selves. So I'm reading some uh, information by Florence Williams. Uh, she wrote The Nature Fix, Why We're Hardwired for Adventure, uh, which is really interesting. And uh, apart from a few other bits and pieces, studies have shown that adventure experiences can improve self-competency, personal empowerment, trust, personal identity, emotional resiliency, and social bonding. And of course, it can just make us, according to Florence, stoked. So she describes it as something about playing in the sweet spot of arousal between sort of the emotional zone between boredom and total fear that fully engages us. So somewhere mm. in there... <laughs> Between yeah, boredom, boredom and, and total, total fear. fear. I like that. Oh, that yeah. That'd be a good band name, Between yeah. Boredom and Fear. <laughs> yes. So a little bit of fear could be reframed as excitement and it energizes a healthy brain and it forces us to pay attention. So it helps us be mindful and fully engaged. And, of course, that's a key part of you know mastering any kind of skill. So there you go. Yeah, yeah, adventures can come anytime, can't they? You yeah. can go to a different shopping centre and it feels like you're having an adventure. Yeah. Be because, <laughs> be 
because you're not. <laughs> it does you, at the moment, that's for sure. <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? Like it's um, it's unfamiliar. You don't know which way to go. Yeah. You don't know. Uh, and rolling back to our you know senses and how smells can be play such an important part. You know, there's always different sights, different smells. Um, mm. Yeah. So you know, even adventure can be found anywhere. I mean, I mm. love getting into adventures and going out to the ocean and you know, hitting the road and doing all sorts. But yeah, at the same it, time, it, you can just go to a different shop. And it's that, a that's it. And I really like the idea of it being somewhere between, you know, boredom and, what was it? Boredom and total fear? Total fear, yeah. Total fear. So it, it doesn't have to be physical. It can be mental or emotional or those kind of things. So, yeah, adventure. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. I think maybe I want to just um, highlight one little cool, th more th one more cool thing about mm -hmm. with regards to the influence of the old Chusha Adventures, mm -hmm. because that leads us to, you know, today's guest and you know, that genre, that lit RPG, um, and you know that the whole chasm, like I said, between boredom and fear. Well, this is sort of between the original page book right up to this whole new style of gaming. So, impact on gaming when with regards to Chusha Adventure. Uh, so Choose Your Own Adventures You Centre Choices have been cited as an influence in numerous games and media that followed the series, um, yeah, that followed the series, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan's popular Bishuju video games, which combine narratives with gameplay, mark the beginning of the trend in modern gaming toward using technology to allow players control over their stories, taking on characteristics of highly detailed Choose Your Own Adventure novels. The Choose Your Own Adventure game books are credited with the heightened popularity of role-playing games, including Dungeons and Dragons. Mass Effect 2 also credits the Choose Your Own Adventure series as an inspiration in its narrative-based adaptive difficulty settings. Form Soft's Adventure Player, a portable membership for PlayStation, allows players to build narrative-based games. The interactive fiction community has also credited Choose Your Own Adventure as being a major influence on their existence. I like there that interactive or an interactive fiction community. That sounds well cool. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so to give a bit of an idea, I thought quickly I'll read uh, the, the synopsis for the Aussie Man Apocalypse book one, oh, yes, which is lit great. up. Uh, gee, so could your gap year crew survive the apocalypse in the Aussie Outback? with monsters, magic, and RPG rules. Keith brought three things to the Aussie Manor Apocalypse. One, his trusty barbecue fork. <laughs> now that's plus 15 for damage. <laughs> Two, a giant wombat, which is, to me, that makes it a winner anyway. And three, a group of mates he hadn't seen since high school. Australia already had the world's 10 most poisonous snakes, crocodiles, and sharks. Then the monsters showed up. Isolated in the Aussie Outback with his best mate Nugget, Nugget's sister Mel, who he definitely did not have a thing with, Mel's new latte sipping boyfriend and a British backpacker, why isn't Keith panicked? Because Keith's a gamer and every gamer knows there's always a way to power level. Also, because he has a giant wombat. Now, <laughs> you'll love this lit RPG Western set in the Australian Outback because it reminds us how people change on a gap year and because it takes the piss. Get it now. So very, there you very go. cool. Yeah. So particularly Aussie. Yeah, definitely. So on that note, uh, how about let's get into the yeah, chat. Yes, let's uh, talk to the man behind the Aussie Man Apocalypse Book One, none other than author C. J. Timms. Medical mastermind and brave opponent to all things that threaten to burn us out. RPG aficionado and author of the Aussie Manor Apocalypse books one, two, and three, King Tide's Curse, as well as QI Vampires and Shearing, Christopher Timms, welcome to the Australian Book Lovers Podcast. Very happy to be here, Darren. Wonderful, and it's uh, very happy to have you here. Now, before we jump into all the uh, meat and bone of all things um, lit RPG, the first thing I wanted to have a quick chat to you about is the cover of your book one of the Aussie Manor Apocalypse, because it features not one, but two of potentially my favourite animals, and that is wombats. So can you tell me, do you have a passion for wombats or what is the importance of wombats? No, I just feel that wombats are a quintessentially Australian animal. They are very solid. They keep on going, even when things get tough and... When you ask someone from overseas what they think about when they think about Australia, I think wombats up there in the top five, along with kangaroos and a few others. 
Yeah, no, I think you put it beautifully. Yep, they they just keep on going and they they dig through anything. And yes, they're they're pretty solid, definitely. Um, but you're right. I, I think I think they should get a little bit more love. They should be. They're not. <laughs> uh, they, they. I think they got to take over the kangaroo. I, I'm putting my vote in. But before we jump into further stuff, uh, so you are your books are what we call lit RPG. Now, look. I'll be honest, it's not a genre that I'm overly familiar with, and I suspect some of our listeners may not be aware. So I guess before we uh, jump into everything, I'm wondering if you could maybe illuminate, you know, exactly what lit RPG genre is, what it entails, and of course, what, uh, it, what, what draws you towards it. Sure. So lit RPG, the definition is controversial. Oh, okay. Love a good it, Yeah, it's a hot topic. So um, traditionally, lit RPG combines the conventions of a computer role-playing game or RPG with science fiction and fantasy novels. Um, it's debatable what is the first lit RPG, but it was popularised very much in Russia in around 2013. Oh, okay. There is also a subset of lit RPG called Game Lit, which has a lot of overlap, and that involves a world in which uh, either the player is trapped in a video game or the world is like a video game, but not with such heavy stats or what's called crunchy elements, which is a term from RPGs. Uh, the main difference there is that an RPG or a lit RPG book would have physical stats representing your strength, your agility, your charisma or luck, mm -hmm. uh, whereas Gamelit would not feature those stats. And Gamelit's pretty broad. It can include things like Jumanji, you could argue, as a gamelit, as well as Ready Player One, both of which have been obviously very popular. Um, but yeah, it's, it's debatable what is the first lit RPG, and I think I'll leave that debate to people wiser than myself. Why not? Why, why show the hornet's nest? Uh, no, no. Ready Player One is, uh, look, I didn't have a chance to read the book, but I, oddly enough, I, I had a copy, a 3D copy, digital copy, and uh, I had to take a bus trip from the bush back to the city after delivering a car. And so on the bus, Ooh. I sat, I had an Oculus, so I actually had a virtual cinema. So I was sitting in a virtual cinema watching a 3D Ready Player One, which of course was about, as I discovered, people living in an alternate reality. <laughs> VR. So it was a very unique experience to get that one up. But a very I'm, Aussie experience. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I guess when I saw, when I see lit RPG, the first thing that came to mind was, oh, I wonder if it's uh, has you know, is it like a uh, high tech version of you know when it comes to the actual literature as opposed to you know the actual games? But is there an element similar to the old choose your own adventure where where you can make decisions and, and essentially you're reading and kind of playing at the same time, or is it more just a a universe in which those statistics and skills and upgrades or level ups occur? So look, it depends if you're talking to a uh, purist or if you're talking to someone who disagrees with them, but your traditional choose your own adventures um, would be a distinct entity. Mm -hmm. You could obviously have a lit RPG that has an element of choose your own adventure, but I don't think I've read any yet. That's probably a niche market someone could tap into. But in terms of the sort of the traditional choose your own adventure ones uh, that we all grew up on, things like Goosebumps and uh, Fright Street and all those traditional choose your own pathway ones. I don't think I've actually read a lit RPG with that element in it. Oh, well, there you go. Maybe that's a niche you will. Uh, There's my next book, eh? Yes. <laughs> Great work, Darren. <laughs> no problems at all. Copyright, Darren, has a good. <laughs> no, no. Now, at the risk of maybe covering a topic that you've probably been asked or, or chatted about quite a few times. Um, so I read in that in 2018, um, you set a goal of attempting one project per month in order to combat, oh, sorry, combat what is essentially burnout or, or, or mental exhaustion or physical exhaustion. Um, now that's obviously a passion which I'm hoping to chat with you about further, but I was just wondering in that period where you were attempting one project Per month i'm just wondering oh well first of all i'm wondering where that idea came from to to take on that sort of uh goal but also what were you surprised to learn and find out about yourself by doing those projects each month yeah sure so the idea came from reading gretchen rubin's book uh, the happiness project in which she talked about taking on one project a month to improve her overall happiness levels um so which is a really good book i'd highly recommend it to anyone and I thought, well, that's okay. You know, I, I'm reasonably happy. I've, I've, I've passed my medical exams. I'm a doctor. I'm ready to go. But I have 30 years, possibly more, of working as a doctor. 
And the rates of burnout are reasonable across all medical specialties. And indeed, um, most health specialties, there is a risk of burnout. So what I set out to do was say, okay, I'm gonna start this right from the start. I'm gonna try and optimize my risk of not burning out. Mm -hmm. So I took that idea from Gretchen Rubin's happiness project and started doing one project a month to try and prevent burnout. Um, some of those were very easy or well, very simple. So one month I simply tried doing a bit of yoga every week, but in the November month, I tried something called NaNoWriMo, which I'm sure you're very aware of, which mm -hmm. is National Novel Writing Month. And I always really wanted to write a novel. And this was, I guess, the time that I just really sat down and did it. Wow. And, and did you discover, have any self-discoveries um, by, you know, intentionally focus on doing something you haven't done before? I'm, I'm guessing most projects were. Um, did it, uh, you know, well, I guess one thing you discovered your, your love and passion for writing. Was there anything else that you were surprised to find emerged from within? It's a good question. I think I really enjoyed through my writing, exploring sort of themes of country Australia and the characters I've met in my time in country Australia. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of the other things I found out along the way doing that 12 month burnout prevention project, I found that there wasn't some magic silver bullet, but that doing basic things really well were the best for me. So sleeping well, getting a bit of exercise every day, uh, not over caffeinating, eating well, which are all the things I usually tell my patients, but uh, they're surprisingly effective. Yeah, that's an interesting point too, because I think, uh, you know, look, probably now more than ever, uh, there is that risk of burnout and it, it doesn't necessarily just have to be career or work related. It could be, I know there's a new term coming out, I think, or, or a new concept, which is uh, news burnout, you know. Uh, of Oh, absolutely. You know, and, absolutely. and I think um, while I haven't heard until now of the, you know, one project a month challenge or, or uh, I guess, um, program, uh, but I think you raise a really good point, and that is just to find the time to remember you've got to focus on yourself every now and then. And uh, because I think, uh, would you agree that maybe burnout comes from maybe neglecting ourselves? Is that is that a big key issue? Oh, I would say so, absolutely. Um, burnout's recognised as a condition uh, by the World Health Organisation now, and I guess one of the dangers of taking on a, a different project a month for 12 months is that you, in fact, burn out from throwing another task on yourself to do. <laughs> uh, but the it's important to tend to yourself. Yes. You're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. And now that uh, the weather's warming up, um, you know, I live down here on the beach in sunny South Australia, and I can almost guarantee that uh, there's going to be a different kind of burnout in the in the ambience of the days as the uh, as everyone gets uh, yes. and has fun and uh, decides to throw money away with rubber. But that's a whole other issue. Now, you've, you've explained a little bit about Lip RPG and the fact that, you know, this... Uh, this love of writing emerged from uh, doing different projects. And I read at the, the intro of book one of the, uh, the Manor Apocalypse that you wanted to write, uh, one of the inspirations was to write a lit RPG book that tackled the issues of young rural Australians coming of age. And I understand that, that a rural, rural, sorry, rural environment was also something that you self grew up in. So I'm wondering, you know, what sort of issues, or more importantly, what important issues do you feel that people that have grown up in the city might not be aware of and that need to be, uh, draw a bit of attention? Yeah, sure. So if I could take a step back, my, my introduction to sort of role-playing games and, and strategy games uh, happened when I was living in Maria and Batemans Bay uh, down on the south coast of New South Wales. Oh, okay. um, I was very big into Warhammer, uh, which is a tabletop uh, strategy game as well as uh, trying to play online role-playing games. But it was quite difficult because the internet connection was very slow, uh, which is itself more it's of probably, an issue back then. Probably still an issue now, I suspect. Still an issue now. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I moved to Sydney essentially at the end of high school and there were a reasonable number of challenges. I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship to cover most of my uni expenses. Fantastic. Um, but a lot of people really struggle and you know, the rent is high, the cost of housing is high. Uh, in order to move to the city to undertake courses like uh, healthcare or nursing, um, it's, it's difficult. And it, it's now 
a bit better. You know, it's, there's never been more telehealth education than ever, and there's small campuses propping up in more and more regional towns. But it's hard to get to the city in the first place to train in health, and then it's hard to keep people in the country long term with health. The retention rates are lower than they could be, and part of the issue may be that people have to travel to the city to train for you know anywhere from four to eight years before they can start doing country work. Um, other issues, that's me rambling on a bit about the rural healthcare issue. Which yeah, is no, no. Uh, yeah, this definitely sounds like an important one too. Um, but other issues are just, you know, access to good quality jobs. Um, but for me, it's mostly coming back to the, uh, the rural healthcare and getting to uni and being able to afford to go to uni. Mm. Well, it's, it's interesting without getting into too much of, of current affairs, but, uh, you know, there's that feeling that maybe the landscape's slowly changing. You know, there's talk of people moving away from the city and more, you know, actually uh, choosing to relocate to country areas. Um, you know, obviously the cost of housing can be one issue, but, but also I think from, you know, these lockdowns and whatnot have uh, given people uh, that, that brief moment to pause and, and really think about the loss of their living and if they're working from home then you know i guess that idea of hey well we can live anywhere you know realistically exactly and exactly uh, it's a great so, thing for rural health yeah so maybe the you know the tides are slowly turning and maybe we really will start uh, seeing you know a, a new love for living in regional areas and of course from that we we get growth and economic boosts and uh, yeah hopefully rural health is is on the rise from here on in now yeah so i mean that's um uh, the main issue I wanted to talk about in my book, but one of the ideas that I got for writing it was uh, if you've seen Stranger Things, for example. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, you, in America, you sort of associate uh, people playing Dungeons and Dragons with sort of more regional towns or rural towns sometimes, particularly in literature, although it's played everywhere, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one of the things that sort of spurred me to want to write a lit RPG. Oh, there you go. Well, I, I've never actually played any, uh, for example, Dungeons and Dragons or, or role-playing games um, in the past. However, I, I think I've brought this up before, but uh, I've, I've got, oh, I love my virtual reality and there is a, a Dungeons and Dragons virtual reality now. And when yeah, you, absolutely. Yeah, and you enter the room and you're actually in a Stranger Things basement before you play the role, start playing the game. So very cool. Um, but look, now I think it is, uh, let, let's jump to, you know, what the listeners are really here for, which is all about your books. And um, look, I'm wondering if you can tell our listeners all about the Aussie Manor Apocalypse series, because it does, definitely sounds and looks cool. So just wondering, can you give us a little bit of insight into the inspiration behind the series and maybe give our listeners and avid readers out there a little glimpse into perhaps some of the awesome adventures that are waiting to be found? Yeah, no worries. Um, so I'm one of the lit RPG writers in Australia. There are some guys doing uh, more better than me, uh, there's a guy in Tasmania who writes under the name Shirtaloon who actually got into the top 10 of the Amazon uh, rankings for Kindle books. Good stuff. And a guy called Alex Kozlovsky who writes Alpha Physics Wagga, which is a great book. Um, but my book, The Aussie Manor Apocalypse, is a series about a bunch of mates who take a gap year, end of gap year trip out to Broken Hill. And while they're on the road out to Broken Hill, the apocalypse hits. And overnight, the world goes from being the standard world we know it to one filled with monsters, magic, and RPG rules. So sounds awesome already. It's very. <laughs> <laughs> um, the idea is that this is a group of mates who've gone off and done their own things for their gap year, and they've just come back together. And I use the post-apocalyptic setting to explore what they've missed out on from each other's lives and how they've changed and grown compared to high school. And it's focused around a few main characters. Mm -hmm. uh, Kit Walker, who is the protagonist. His best mate, Nelson Nugget Krangle. His best mate's little sister, Melanie Krangle, who he definitely didn't have a previous relationship with that Nugget didn't know about. <laughs> and Mel's new boyfriend from Melbourne. So a very good little mix there. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun little group. And they're joined by a British backpacker along the way but their challenge is to get from the wilderness to the relative safe zone of Broken Hill. And along the way, they pick up a number of 
allies, including a giant wombat and, and uh, meet a few interesting characters. Yes, giant wombat. I think you've got me, you've sold it for me already. Uh, and not, not to mention, I've got a soft spot in, in my heart for Broken Hill for various reasons. Uh, but as you were describing that, as you know, the apocalypse coming as, as they, you know, heading to Broken Hill, I know that for the direction I have to take, you know, if I leave from South Australia uh, after a particular town, there can be just, you know, hundreds of kangaroos that you've got to dodge on the road. So I, I, in my head, I was imagining them all turning into monsters. <laughs> and that yes. would make one hell of a journey to get there. And it's a great setting. It's, it, there's a reason they filmed one of the Mad Max films there because the country is just both beautiful and stark and remote and it's, it's magnificent. It is, it is. And uh, so I'm sure you've, you'll have a love of the, uh, the living statues there. Oh, yes, the living statues do make an appearance in the book. Oh, do they? Um, Excellent. Yes, they certainly do. And uh, I won't spoil it for the readers, but they're definitely in the book of significance. Okay. And was it always planned to be a, a series or was it something that you started and realised that, uh, wow, you know, there's, there's more books in this? So I left myself some room when I wrote it. Mm -hmm. I, um, I think one of the traps you can fall into as a fantasy writer, as a very new writer um, myself, is you can plan out a whole universe in a fantasy novel and then if the first novel doesn't do so well, you're left with this big world that you haven't fully explored um, and you haven't really focused on the individual book because you're so preoccupied with the series. So the, um, the Aussie Manor Apocalypse, I actually thrashed out in about, about six weeks. Um, oh, wow. After I, so I, I published my first book, King Tide's Curse, and that was a work of la love and labour that I spent four years sort of chipping away at little bits um, in between medical training. Mm -hmm. And then I, I launched it. It did all right. It did all right. But I didn't feel there was enough interest in it to sit down and write another uh, 180,000 word saga. So the Aussie Manor Apocalypse was my, in a way, my reaction to that in that I wanted to write a discreet, but very fun little book mm -hmm. um, in a short amount of time that would focus very much on the story of these very focused individuals, but leave me room to have plenty of expansion in the future if it did in fact work because I had no idea. I was throwing spaghetti against the wall <laughs> to see what would stick. Um, I had no idea if people would want to read a lit RPG book about Australian characters or if it would just be, uh, if people would just want to continue reading about American and English characters, which was the, tr the predominant uh, trend at the time. Okay, yeah. Well, who's not going to love, uh, you know, an apocalypse featuring giant wombats? Well, that's, yeah. that's, the, that's the feedback I generally get. And a guy get. called Nugget. <laughs> oh, Nugget is my favourite character. Is it? Is oh, is he, should I say? You mentioned King Tide's Curse. That was your first book. And uh, um, now that cover definitely promises a whole lot of fun. Um, but it's interesting that you've done... So in essence, you've actually approached uh, you know, writing in two completely different ways. Then you've had the option to... Or the opportunity to you know, work for a long time on one particular book and then you've gone in and, and just blasted out a story. So did, did you find, do you find one is better than the other as far as the writing style and the way you wrote or is it just two now, you know, you've got two different tools in your belt? I think it's two different tools and horses for courses. The, mm -hmm. um, the thing I found with setting an arbitrary time limit was you just make decisions and right or wrong, you decide what you want this character to be doing or how this scene's going to play out and you just get it done. I think that's good. I think there's writers who can work like that and writers who prefer other ways. Uh, but that was, that was all worked for me and has worked for writing the rest of my books so far. Mm -hmm. And it must've been, uh, I'm assuming a few late night sessions do, trying to uh, write a book yeah. while you're also studying medicine. Um, I actually, to get some of my books out, I actually tried something from a book called 5am club, which was a, a good read where you, essentially get up at 5 a.m. to do some exercise, meditate, journal, and then thrash out about an hour of work before you go to your actual work. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that was quite successful for a while. I've, I've backed up on that, but it, it was one method to get your first novel written. Mm -hmm. And what, it, what, what can you tell our readers about King Tide's Curse? Like what, what sort of uh, cool stories await? Yeah, sure. So King Tide's Curse has similar themes, mateship, bunch of Aussies from the country moving to the city but it's about 
what I would call the Aussie monster defense squad and this secret club of people that exists behind the scenes in Sydney who stop monsters from crossing over from other worlds. Oh, wow. And the, it took the form of a sort of a training academy style book where they're enrolled as apprentice fracture smiths and they have to fix these fractures in the world and the universe and send monsters back where they should be. That's and cool. I, I guess I used a little bit of inspiration from my medical training days, just thinking about some of the, uh, some of the, both the fun we got up to and some of the more challenging parts to write part of the book. But it's essentially an urban fantasy with uh, Australian themes mm -hmm. and follows a, a follows a group of uh, misfits trying to stop the end of the world. Okay. And uh, so obviously set in Sydney uh, and that was, so obviously got your inspiration from the city. Um, was it something that came about from having, you know, from that crossover, from coming from, you know, regional Australia into the city? Was it, you know, is it something that sort of, um, that, that the kernel of that story emerged as you were acclimatising to city living? Oh, I would say there are definitely elements of that. There's a, a character in King Tide's Curse who I'd consider the progenitor to Nelson Nugget Krangle. Uh, ah. The character in King Tide's Curse's name is Titus Mangrove, uh, the Bogan Knight. And I, I love <laughs> writing him. I think I sort of intentionally wrote him differently for the Aussie Manor Apocalypse, uh, reinventing that character. But the, I guess in terms of country influence, there was a bit of culture clash there. King Tide's Curse leans more towards sort of how we train people and uh, there's, there's quote unquote monsters in it who are essentially people who have burnt out apostrophes and uh, are covered with sort of silvery scale and have, have lost their abilities and their powers. And I found it was an interesting vehicle to talk about burnout peripherally. Oh, okay. So, so you, you have characters that actually have visual representations, you know, of, of that manifestation of burnout. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's, absolutely. that's really interesting. Yeah. And I'm still trying to sit here, trying to imagine uh, a Bogan Knight, what, what he or she might look like. Um, that'd, that'd be pretty cool. Another book, you, of course, that you've released, uh, and it's a very unique title, is QI Vampires and Shearing. I've got, I've got to ask, what's, what on earth is that story about? So my parents and my wife asked me the same question. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's actually, uh, the QI is pronounced key as in um, uh, C-H-I or Q-I, key as in... Uh, ah, apologies. Key, key vampires and shearing. Key vampires and shearing. And it's, it's designed as a deliberately mashed up genre book. So it involves my desire to write a book about vampires, but combining that with an Australian post-apocalyptic setting so it, it takes place in a, a fictional land where there are lit rpg elements but there are also vampires and lightning storms that ravage the country and mm -hmm. a series of plucky heroes who for want of a better word are essentially australian but uh, they're called other things okay and i've got to ask is there any sheep shearers in there there are um so the, the shearing part of the the title refers to um the one of the secret societies in the in the world which are the shearers who were designed to um tackle problems others can't oh look that that sounds the rest lot, exactly like a recipe for a bestseller i mean that has to be the first time in literate history i'm guessing that we've got sheep shearers and vampires colliding that is that is it, awesome. it was it was certainly a uh, collision um uh, a lot of people didn't quite know what to make of it and it was uh it, it was one of my more fun books to write it didn't quite do as well as the aussie matter apocalypse but i i, I found it quite enjoyable to write mm -hmm. and fun i think is a a word that that when i look at all your covers it all of them seem to definitely promise the reader a lot of fun so and, and curious about the covers too because they really pop um and they, they've got some really interesting use of color and silhouette and images. So how did the covers come about? Is that something you had a big hand in? Did you design them or did you know somebody who helped you out? Uh, a couple of, a couple of different uh, things that happened with that. So my Aussie Manor Apocalypse covers were designed by a lovely guy down in Melbourne, Andrew Hoare, who's a very good cover designer. And I sent him this sort of 
thousand word email about what I wanted for my first cover <laughs> and, you know, how many giant wombats can we put on it? And I want a man, you know, swinging a sword with a magical barbecue fork and also another person shooting lasers. And he sort of sent an email back saying, look, I, I'm happy to work with you, but we need to focus this just a little. Um, so we then went and looked at the tropes from the genre and for post-apocalyptic, it's generally someone silhouetted looking out across a, a, a landscape and at that time, I was just, you know, it's just a, a light hobby and I wanted to save a few dollars. So I went to Adobe Stock Images and we found the closest match for that we could. Mm -hmm. And then we whacked a wombat on it and we whacked a road sign on it. And all of my covers do feature a road sign of an Australian animal. And uh, Andrew did his magic and it came out with the Aussie Manor Apocalypse uh, first novel cover. And then uh, he was actually very good. He, he updated that later for... Um, for audiobook style and two of my covers for key vampires and shearing as well as king tide's curse are uh, done by uh, an artist from a company called i'm going to pronounce this wrong but meeble art or m-i-b-l art and um they provide a a cover design service and that's uh, another company i've used and I, I think i just wanted at a certain point to see if i could get away with whacking a man a topic kangaroo with waving a sword around on a cover and see if anyone would let me get away with it and i did so <laughs> and more, all the more power to you yeah i mean it's, it, it is such a uh, a fun and you know just a magic part of writing i think when you when you get to organizing the cover or at least starting to think about what sort of cover you'd like it's uh yeah it's a good thing especially if you're doing it you know when, when you finish your manuscript and and uh, yeah, you get to, it's, it's like having a champagne for your mind. I think you get oh, absolutely, it's the reward for getting through it. Yeah, hundred percent. So lit RPG, uh, Aussie Manor, Apocalypse. So do the characters obviously in? Uh, well, I say obviously. I'm assuming in in games themselves, each player or each character has you know a certain level of skills or certain point structure. Is that right? And is, is that something that applies in these books? Yeah, absolutely. So the the best way to describe it, I guess, would be a Dungeons and Dragons style character sheet. And that involves each person has listed numbers describing their attributes. So someone who's very charismatic has, has a, a number put to that. They're just about how charismatic they are. Mm -hmm. And you can increase that every time you level up by completing quests or fighting monsters. Um, and you can choose to put numbers into your strength or your agility or how smart you are. And there's a very interesting decision pathway for that. You know, if you, if you were given the choice how to upgrade yourself, would you make yourself a hulking strong man or would you be insanely charismatic or would you increase your brain to the power of a supercomputer? And the, I, I think that's one of the appeals for lit RPG for a lot of people is the, is the mechanical progression of the character that you can actually see in numbers. So, so it's, a character arc over a story that is represented by numbers to a degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's super cool. And I'm assuming, of course, that depending on battles or certain events in you know high stress moments, I'm assuming those points can be reduced as well. Oh, absolutely. There's a point, uh, the darkest point of the first novel, where uh, Kit Walker loses a series of his um his stat points and has to be dragged out of it by his mates. So it, it, it really was a fun mechanic to play with with writing the characters because a lot of people talk about the techniques when they sit down to write a story. Brandon Sanderson, I think, is very big on sitting down and writing out a big spreadsheet or table of how each character values things like money and family and career and how that compares to all his other characters and where he thinks the, the conflict points will be. And using the numbers actually helps me write out how I think a character looks. So, you know, Nelson Nugget Krangle, for example, doesn't have a great intelligence score, but he does have a very good wisdom score as well as a high strength. And um, it just helps you clarify in your head how these characters would react in certain situations. Yeah, that is a really uh, interesting approach. And I think, you know, here I am, I'm just quietly having a think of and listening to what you're saying. And and it's to me, it's come across as you know the opportunity to really get under the you know pull up the bonnet and get into the engine of the character, and uh, it sounds like a really cool 
exercise to do actually to put a little spreadsheet down and for characters that I'm working on and and to to assign numbers to as a representation of, of strengths, weaknesses, and and, and different uh, aspects of their personality and and capabilities. That's that's really cool. Speaking of leveling up and and numbers and all that sort of stuff now you're obviously a doctor now and you are an rpg fan so i've got a very important question if you could level up with just one biological enhancement you yourself what would it be oh great question great question i think i would go dexterity oh because okay. i can be a bit of a klutz sometimes <laughs> Wow. Okay. That, that's a, I mean, definitely an important attribute to have to, and to level up, but uh, yeah, there you go. So I guess upload up, sorry, uh, level up your dexterity and get those swords and ninja throwing stars and nunchucks. And that's what I'm. If I can turn the question back on you, Darren. Oh, okay. If, yeah. Yeah. Fair if, you call. Could, if you could increase one stat, uh, let's, let's get, go with the standard six of strength, dexterity, intelligence wisdom charisma and luck which would you increase do you know what? i would increase luck be Smart because one. yeah Smart because yeah. It, it's the only thing i think sometimes that can combat chaos because there's been many a time where things have happened that's been pure bad luck so it would be nice to, <laughs> to to reverse that around a little bit especially when you know driving you need a little bit of luck when you're you know out of the city and in the outback so you know, you don't want anything to go wrong with your car and all, all those no, sorts of things. Certainly. Yes, yes, bit of luck. So to get on a little bit more of a serious topic, um, obviously, you know, the concept of burnout and how it can affect our lives is, is a really important issue. Just wondering if you could maybe uh, let myself and our listeners know a little bit about what, um, you know, why that issue has become such a strong part of your, you know, I guess your quest to educate people and patients and is it something that you've experienced yourself or and you know what what couple of real simple tips that uh people can take away from this and, and improve their lives and maybe reduce that sort of risk of burnout in, in such crazy times that we're living in so burnout is a big issue for the medical community we've all seen uh several of our colleagues burn out completely from medicine and not return, which both affects them and their families, as well as being someone who can't provide services for um, the community, particularly in country areas where, where every doctor is really needed, every nurse is needed, any allied health professional. The worst outcome is, is not specifically burnout, but um, uh, there's also high rates of depression uh, amongst doctors and there have been some bad outcomes from that. The, so burnout's an issue we're familiar with in healthcare. And I, I think it's helpful to everyone to lower the rates of burnout, both because you then have more doctors providing care, more nurses providing care, as well as uh, beneficial for the individual. Uh, each, each individual who doesn't burn out obviously has a better outcome. The main things that I would say about preventing burnout is that there's systemic issues, which you often can't control, but um, I feel that everyone should have a good GP. Um, there is access numbers and crisis numbers that people can access if they're feeling burnt out and they feel they can't talk to someone. And I can send you to those after the show, uh, basic ones like um, Beyond Blue, as well as uh, various crisis lines. And uh, just make sure we look after ourselves, particularly in these crazy times, uh, you know, presentations of people to the emergency department for mental health concerns are far up in comparison to previous years. Um, and that's a very human response. There is a very, very palpable reason for people to be stressed and exhausted and low in their mood at this time. Um, so I think everyone should have a, a good GP um, if they need to seek advice elsewhere or, or engage in counseling. There's now never been more online counseling services um, and just making sure we look after ourselves and be kind to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And and I read that you you mentioned you felt you know the lit RPG and and in these books and creating these characters has helped you in a in a in a way to uh, or it's it's helped your ability to build relationships with with clients and patients. Um, how how did that come about? Do you think? Yeah. So a number of factors. The first is that. 
I feel in writing, it's practicing putting yourself in someone else's shoes and seeing how a character would act, uh, not necessarily how you would act in a, a given scenario. So mm -hmm. it, it's an exercise in empathy and seeing how someone else would act in a given set of circumstances. So it was very good practice for that. Then it's also uh, just a good thing to have a hobby outside of medicine. And it could be very easy to let medicine be your entire focus, mm -hmm. but it's very healthy to have a, some hobbies outside of medicine. For me, this is one of my hobbies. Um, and it, it also just makes you curious being a writer, I think makes you curious about the people around you and what stories they have and listening to their stories, because there's often some gems in there and, and it just switches your role often as a doctor to someone who's a gatherer of stories and not just necessarily just a, a treating clinician. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, I think it's a beautiful thing that, you know, literature, and like you said, that that ability to put yourself in other people's shoes or or explore different emotions and, you know, methods of response uh, via characters that you've created. I think it's a beautiful thing. It's, it's a wonderful tool. And I think it's fantastic that it's given you that, you know, this, uh, I guess you could say a level up when it comes to yes. you know, talking to talking to your patients. Uh, now you mentioned, you know, obviously it's a, a good hobby and something that uh, can, you know, take you outside of the medical world and let you, let you explore art and explore yourself and, and characters. Are you currently working on anything new now? Uh, yes, I am. Well, I'm, I'm working on the fourth book in the Aussie Manor Apocalypse, which is called Stagger Home. Oh, uh, I just got... oh, that's a perfect title. <laughs> yes. So uh, the cover art for that is done. I'm still, uh, I'm still writing a large chunk of it. I found with some of my later releases that getting the cover art done crystallizes what I want to write the book about. So mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. that, that's still underway. I have a number of books that I would like to write. Um, I don't have a lot of time to write them in, but should I get the time, I have a couple of books that look at what's happening in Sydney during the Aussie Manor apocalypse, because so far it's all been about various remote locations, tropical cans, Broken Hill. And uh, I would very much like to explore what happens in Sydney during the Aussie Manor apocalypse. And then I have a backlog of other projects that I would love to do, uh, but who knows if there'll ever be time. And I would like to bring the Aussie Manor apocalypse to its natural conclusion as well. Mm -hmm. Well, you're definitely never going to be bored, that's for sure. No, no, <laughs> Now, when it comes to, so you, you obviously got this book coming, you've got other book ideas, but, and I'm, I'm willing to bet you're pretty pressed for time when it comes to your normal daily routine or weekly routine. Do you, when you get sort of those moments of thoughts or ideas, like you think, oh, that'd be perfect, or this bit, uh, do you jot them down? Do you just memorize them? Or do you have a, you know, do you record a quick, thing into your phone with your voice uh what how do you catch those lightning in a bottle moments so i have a to-do list app and that's how i write them down because then it's out of my brain i'm not trying to remember it all day and i don't get home and go oh gee whiz what was that great idea <laughs> i thought of over lunch um so my to-do list app has about 220 things to do on it and it's currently less of a to-do list app and more of just a jotted ideas pad yep. um that's how i capture it and I think, uh, you know, whatever works for each author, I think um, uh, some people just use written uh, journals, some people just speak into their phone. Uh, I, I find it helpful just to get it out of the brain, otherwise I'm thinking about it all day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and what about for our awesome readers out there? What, what, how would you, if you were standing on the street corner and all those people walking past, how would you convince them to come in and get your books? What's, what's, the, what's the big reason? that people are going to love your books? I guess for my Aussie Manor Apocalypse series, the way I would put it is, do you think your gap year crew could survive an apocalypse? And that is the question of that series is, could a bunch of mates survive an apocalypse? Fair and enough. I, I, I don't know about, about it. it. Yeah, I was, I was just thinking then some of my mates, I'm not sure if I want to, <laughs> how we'd go against the apocalypse. But um, I, I try to write essentially very fast paced, humorous, Australian themed literature that doesn't take itself too seriously. If you want an in-depth discussion 
on serious topics. I'm not the author for you, but if you want to see a man ride a giant wombat into battle, swinging a magical barbecue fork, then I'm your guy. There are elements of, you know, touching moments, but my books respectively feature a man riding a battle kangaroo, uh, a vampire, a lightning slinging princess, a paladin who's actually a pub bouncer. And I'm for a niche genre. I'm not for everyone, but if you want to have a lighthearted time uh, with minimal cussing, then I'm probably the guy for you. Yeah, look, I, I think that's a beautiful description with some of those crazy, uh, <laughs> crazy visuals that you're inspiring. And I think, you know, it, all of your tales from what you've told me today, they really sound like they are a celebration of Aussie culture and, and you know, bringing that Aussie culture into, you know, f fantastic realms, I suppose, with... Uh, where monsters and, and the apocalypse can happen. So that sounds like a good time to me. You know, your covers definitely look like a lot of fun. And that is such an important thing, you know, today, as far as sometimes we just forget to have fun. And uh, by the look of your books, that's a promise that you can have a lot of fun. And when it comes to fun, what do you, so you still play a lot of RPG games? No, look, it's funny. So this is, this is quite funny. I found, at a certain point in my medical training, I had to stop playing RPG games and, and computer games that were based on RPGs because they took a lot of your time up and you didn't end up with any further accomplishments or training or, or success from them. So I went off RPGs for actually quite a few years and I've now somehow replaced them by writing RPG style books, which lets me feel that niche without uh, getting stuck on a computer playing a video game for hours on end as I would have done in my college years. So you're getting, you're still getting the joy from it, but in a different way. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Exactly. Yes. Now I, the one big question I have to, uh, to conclude this, so uh, very awesome interview that you've uh, so gratefully given us is if I were to be one of a new patient on your list and to come into your surgery, would I see any stuffed uh, toy wombats? No, it's a Why great not? question. I mean, I, I, I'm pretty open about it. I put, um, I joined my current practice about nine months ago and they're marvelous. I put up on the uh, introductory Facebook post that, you know, my details and that I write novels, but I think the vast majority of my patients are largely unaware. I've had one guy ask me about it, but he was sort of one in a million. So I, I, I'm quite proud of what I've done, but I, I don't really spruik it at work. I just keep that part of my life separate. Um, I go by the sneaky cover name of CJ Tims rather than Christopher Tims, which is mm -hmm. not the world's most elaborate deception, but <laughs> I, I think I try to keep it a little bit separate. I would, I would be flattered if someone mentioned it, but I, I, when I'm at work, I'm there doing my doctoring and when I'm writing, I'm writing and they use up different parts of my brain, I think. Well, then I think uh, what should go on the list for uh, Father Christmas to bring for you for Christmas is a wombat key ring. That wombat way, key ring. Yeah, yeah. That way, when Done. you finish for the day and you go to get in Done. your car, you can look you down and go, hmm, that's all right. I'm the creator of some fantastic Aussie adventures. But, but uh, Dr. Christopher Timms, it has been absolutely marvellous having a chat with you. And I thank you so much for taking the time to be a part of the Australian Book Lovers podcast. And I'm just still wondering if you could let our amazing listeners know how they can learn more about you or find your books. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm on Amazon. That's where I sell exclusively nearly all of my books. Mm -hmm. um, the, there is a website uh, for CJ Timms Writes where I will always try to post my new content and I have a mailing list where I will try to put out ahead of time, any new content uh, first and where I will also occasionally post links to audiobooks. Uh, at this stage, it's the Aussie Manor Apocalypse that has the audiobooks, but if I get free promotional links, that's where they'll come out first. Fantastic. Uh, and those are the main channels I use to communicate. I do have other social media pipes like Facebook, but I'm most active through my mailing list and mm -hmm. just directly through Amazon. Mm -hmm. and, and all of those uh, locations or links that you just mentioned, of course, we'll be putting in the show notes. But you did mention the audio book. Is, is, is it your voice doing the recording or how did that come about? No, I mean, my smooth dulcet tones are okay, <laughs> but I, I, I thought I would get a professional to do it. Um, which was a great experience. I never thought I'd produce an audiobook. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, 
I went through Find Away Voices, who were very, uh, very professional. Um, I got Chris Miller, who's, who's a fantastic voice actor, done a number of projects, but I somehow scored him to read the Aussie Manor Apocalypse. And he did a, a great job. He, he sort of came back to me and said, look, Chris, it's, it's not my standard thing, but I'll, I'll work with my soundboard and I'll see what I can come up with. And he really delivered. And there is a trailer uh, for that on the Authors Direct pr- platform or wherever you buy your audiobooks, Amazon, Scribed, uh, Bibliotheca, that really just nails down the element of what that book is about. And um, if the listeners are interested, I, I would highly encourage them to just have a listen to the 30 second trailer that is on all of those platforms to get an idea. Yeah, that's cool. Um, well, who knows? Maybe I'll find a way to uh, insert that trailer in the podcast. Um, most definitely. But that's uh, there you go. So for the listeners out there that, uh, well, are running flat out and not finding the time to read as much as they'd like, grab a copy of the audio book, whether you're in the car, train or plane, where, however you're traveling or even just walking on the beach or going for a jog, it's, uh, why not uh, dive into a world of uh, apocalyptic outback with uh, giant wombats and, and crazy kangaroos by the sounds of it, with wielding swords, is that right? Uh, was it I the kangaroos that had the swords? swords? But that is a great idea. You're really, really filling out my to-do list idea pad at this session. <laughs> okay. Well, that'll be number 236 on your thing. Copyright Darren Cousin Go 2021. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, Chris, it has been fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time to have a chat. All the very best with the new book. And uh, what, is there a potential or um, temporary, temporary uh, projected release date? Uh, at this stage, I was going for December, but given lockdown and pandemic, we will see what happens and I don't have a firm date for anyone. That's okay. I, that, I think in the, today's environment, one thing we've learned, I guess, or hope we've learned, is that is we just got to take each day as it comes. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, that takes a lot of the burden of trying to combat the chaos, I think. It's uh, just uh, bite sizes, just like bite sizes of the elephant. One day bite sized chunks. Yeah, definitely. Well, all the very best. And we look forward to uh, finding out when that new book comes out and hopefully we can come you back on, get you back on, sorry, for a chat and uh, let us know about book four. Thanks so much for having me. Absolute pleasure. You take care. What a great chat. And I am just blown away by people whose work life is so incredibly busy and physically demanding and shifts all over the place and yet they still find time to be creative so yeah it's it's good and challenging uh the sort of ingrained burnout that a lot of health professionals feel and i'm thinking particularly even you know in the in the last couple of years we've had so many of our health staff get burnt out uh from just managing you know and trying to staff our hospitals and and those kind of things and it just is another example is the fabulous Hayley Walsh who works full-time as a nurse in one of the busy um, uh, I think in an aged care uh, but also uh, in Sydney in New South Wales and she's not only writing books but she started a podcast as well so you know these people are just amazing and really deserve our gratitude and support so go and buy their books or yes, listen one, to them or do whatever 100 yeah. percent. and yeah. it, it is it is like look I'm, it's virtually impossible sometimes to find any kind of balance mm. but but you can stack the odds in your favor like for example you know the the, the joy that someone might have from writing a book or and especially you know with with mr tims he, he said he doesn't really have that time to to, to actually you know play the big games anymore mm. um but maybe writing about it brings that still brings that joy and relives that joy until that moment he can yeah. find that time and so that uh two hours he might write or one hour he might write may carry the weight of 10 hours of joy yes uh, that, that then can balance things out so yeah. uh, yes which brings me talking about creative people mm. to my first quote well the irony was i th- i was thinking i would uh, find a dice because this is a, a role-playing game yeah edition <laughs> so i was going to roll a dice to see who actually starts you know, ah so. well i could use my dungeons and dragons dice oh, because have- all three of my adult children play Dungeons and Dragons, both as a family group with a few people, and they play variously with other people. Um, and so, to you know, involve their old parents, they brought us 
dice and last Christmas or the Christmas before so we did play some games and it, it was a bit of fun so it was quite oh that's good. awesome have you got uh, one right there I haven't it, down in the bedroom so no uh, uh, <laughs> but actually, if you'd warned me I could have done it now what I do have now I'm, obviously no one can see that but um and you can't hear it because it's silent because it's sort of it's a gem or well, not a gem it's a, a rock but it's a um I can't remember the word for it now, but it's <laughs> it's a rock that looks like it's uh, silver, but it's not. But they it grows in perfectly square formations. Mm -hmm. uh, and and like, that's for forgive me, listeners. I should know the name, but it's completely slipped my mind for the moment. So I'm going to pretend it's a it's a uh, dice. So you should be able to hear it. I'm going to roll it okay. now. The rules will be, um, I will say odd. It will be U star, even I start. Excellent. So now we're. Now, there is actually no numbers on it, so I will make it up. But <laughs> <laughs> So you could be cheating. I could, could be, be cheating. ripping me off. <laughs> it's actually just very smooth and shiny. But here we go. We'll listen out for the dice roll. I think you heard that, did you? I did hear that, yeah. Well, guess what? It's five. Ah, oh, excellent. Yeah. So it is me anyway. <laughs> <It> is <you. laughs> All right. So my first quote is by a, it's from Henri Matisse. So Henri Emile Benoit Matisse was a French artist uh, known for both his use of colour and his fluid and original draftsmanship. He was also a, a sculptor and a printmaker, but you know most people know him know of him as a painter. His mm. quote: "Creative people are curious, flexible, persistent, and independent, with a tremendous spirit of adventure and a love of play." Ah. Oh. I'd like yeah. To, yeah, I'd like to put my hand up and say I'm a creative person. Yeah. Um, but then I'm also a lot of other things, like, for example, sometimes lazy, sometimes forgetful. <laughs> but <laughs> no, definitely, I would, yeah, curious, flexible, persistent and independent with a tremendous spirit of adventure and a love of play. Mm. Thank you, Henri Matisse. Yeah, definitely need that uh, sense of adventure and the mm. persistence is, yeah, you, that goes hand in hand with art, doesn't it? Um, mm. There is no art without persistence. Uh, and and speaking of forgetfulness, Pyrides was the rock I was thinking of. Oh, Pyrides, yeah. there you go. Yeah, there we are. Okay, so my first quote is mm -hmm. from a book called Killosophy, or mm. Killosophy by Chris Jami. Wouldn't be a horror book, would it? I don't know. I haven't read that book, oh. actually, but the title has me intrigued. Yeah. <laughs> now, the quote is, as Aristotle said, excellence is a habit. I would say furthermore that excellence is made constant through the feeling that comes right after one has completed a work which he himself finds undeniably awe-inspiring. He only wants to relax until he's ready to renew such a feeling all over again because to him all else has become absolutely trivial. Mm. And that was uh, by author Chris Jamie and it was a quote from his book, Philosophy. Mm. Uh, but I like that. Um, yeah. You, you, you get that search, that, that rush of creativity and um, I, I guess, you know, as I get, no, not so much creativity, maybe just that rush of achievement. And yeah. uh, who, yeah. who doesn't want to be addicted to that? Because anything's yeah. possible if, that one, if that's the thing that gets you up in the morning. Yes, most definitely. So my second quote is from somebody who is a big achiever, Oprah Winfrey, uh, who most people would know as a talk show host but she's also um, a producer an actress an author and a philanthropist yeah so, she's uh, pretty damn successful that's for she sure she is indeed powerhouse and one of her favorite no one of my favorite of her quotes is the biggest adventure you can ever take is to live the life of your dreams hmm yeah i like that yeah it's so, a tough one yeah look <laughs> it know. can be tough but so often when i'm coaching people and they say oh i couldn't do that but when we take the dreams and get them to set a goal and break it down into what's your first step what's your next step and before you know it rather than get to the life of their dreams in 12 months in three months they're you know going i'm here i'm doing it it's fantastic so yeah it's Sometimes it's taking that first step, but yeah, that is the biggest adventure. And it's a quest too, isn't it? Mm. Um, because the adventure kind of is feels like uh, action, you know, uh, movement, you know, mm. tangible things. But but uh, making a quest to, to live your dream, then it's also something you can always be contemplating, always musing on, 
you know, uh, you can be just laying in bed, but you can be working on your quest. Mm. Uh, that's that's my excuse anyway. For <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Working on some very important things. I'm researching. <laughs> researching. <laughs> I'm, I'm contemplating. <laughs> Uh, what have you got for us? Okay, I have a quote by a, a lady by the name of Melissa uh, Stagenis, I think it's pronounced. Um, now, the second quote, I thought I'd do something about a little bit about burnout, because obviously mm -hmm. that was a, a, mm. something that uh, uh, Chris Timms is uh, passionate about educating people about and, and helping people avoid. So the, the quote reads, uh, burnout is the result of too much energy output and not enough energy self-invested. Mm. In other words, it's burning too much fuel then you've put in your tank. Mm -hmm. So by Melissa Stagenis, Stead, yeah. Mm. So you know we don't we don't drive our cars until they're empty, and then you know I think burnout. The analogy for me is you drive your car till it's empty, and then you get out and start pushing it. Yeah. Not to get tanked, just Too to true. keep the journey going. Yeah. And it's like that's not how it should be. Mm. Uh, you know, you should be have time to pull over, not in an OTR because they're just getting shocking. But um, oh, you don't have OTR and what Victoria, is OTR? Oh. Don't worry. That's is that a South Australian, Australian thing like yeah. Stoby poles? Well, it's 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 a you know it's a uh, it's a service station, but they're just popping up everywhere, and they're they're more like they've actually they're just a shop now, a lot oh. more like a supermarket. So that they have uh, yeah, but uh, I get angry because you go you stop you want to just get petrol because it's a petrol yep. station, mm -hmm. but then I find myself stuck between twelve people that want uh, soy mocha latte and the. Ah. <laughs> What are you doing at a petrol station? <laughs> you put them ah, so, and yeah, so now I avoid OTRs like the plague. Uh, I have nothing against the company. It's just that too many people decide to get their their fancy coffees and that they're uh, ignoring all the wonderful cafes we've got. So uh, anyway, there there's Darren's uh, angry episode for uh, <laughs> angry outburst for number four, episode number forty seven. Uh, <laughs> don't so buy coffee in petrol stations. Don't, no, there you go. So <laughs> unless it's the machine one. Yeah, of course. Perhaps I could ask our readers if they have an idea of what books smell like to them. Mm, they could the let us know by sending us a note on the website, by uh, connecting with us on social media. On Twitter, we are at Australian Books. On Facebook and Instagram, we are at Australian Book Lovers. Feel free to reach out and, uh, yeah, what do you think books smell like? If you're a reader... Jump onto the AustralianBookLovers.com website forward slash book lovers and subscribe because we have some giveaways coming up which are very exciting. I'm not going to mention them until the person comes along. Uh, but Chris Timms, of course, who we've just talked to, he gave away five copies of he his did indeed. RPG Super generous. novel of audiobook, which is fantastic. Very generous of him. So if you jump on and become one of our subscribers, you will get my very irregular newsletter. But there is always an opportunity to win something and hear a little bit more about our authors. Yeah. And if you're an Australian author, please feel free to list your books for free with us by going to the Australian Book Lovers website forward slash for authors. And once you have your, your book on the website, you have the opportunity to chat to Darren or I about your work yeah 100 percent. and mm -hmm. as always if you have anything you'd like to promote any news feature anything about your local community mm. by all means write in happy to have a chat on record something we can read something out whatever it might be uh, we'd love to help celebrate uh, australian artists australian readers and anybody involved in supporting australian arts so if you've got someone some event in your community coming up let us know flick us an email we'd love to uh, incorporate it in our news Yes. Um, and I have to say, Veronica, I've suddenly got this um, image in my head of bookstore owners wondering what's going on with people coming in suddenly, <laughs> flicking, smelling, <laughs> putting that one down all, all across Australia. And uh, so all I can say is, please don't start scribbling. Help, help me on pieces of paper and putting oh, them in. You'll do you freak out all the readers. scratch smell, though? Oh, I remember scratch and smell cards. Was yes. It, was... Yeah, the kids had some of those. Yeah, you scratch it, it smells like lemons or peaches or oh, whatever. Did, did, yeah. Do they come with little books? Like, was it supposed to be yeah, part of a yeah, book? I can't remember. Yeah, some of them were books. Some of them were like children's books. Yeah. Oh, I do remember it. Yeah. yeah. And then you and then I thought you could think you could buy the little cards anyway, just for yeah. fun. Um, yeah. yeah. See, books of uh, they're at the forefront of all sorts of technologies. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So, so we have our sign-off. Mm. Have you got some ideas about how we could make the sign-off? 
I Lit am RPG? thinking. I'm thinking maybe Lit RPG, uh, the the Aussie Manor Apocalypse, Australia. Maybe where you know, maybe the wind's blowing. We're out in the middle of the desert. You know, we've, we've got, ah, yeah, in the uh, middle of a, Chris's book. We've got book. a thir- thirsty giant wombat between us, and we can hardly talk because we're dying for you know some water. I think or that's, a beer, that'd be fun. Let's be or a beer, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So we'll be parched and on the point of exhaustion, but we're going to keep going because Good. persistence and adventure. So maybe, maybe I don't know how to do that. I'll just try and be as croaky and <laughs> try as I can, and I'll try and make something out of it. So. You, you will. And you, I really liked the last one. That was particularly good. So, listeners, take care for now and remember to... There's going to be an interesting, but uh, yes, we'll get the Mad Max uh, Aussie Manor Apocalypse vibe happening for that one. That's but it. to all our, all the listeners, thank you so much for joining us for another episode. Uh, it means so much to us, and yeah, it, uh, it it sparks that joy and sense of achievement if we know that anybody out there has got a smile on their face, or maybe has been inspired to read a good book, or get pen to paper, or finger to keyboard. And uh, so, yeah, thank you so much for joining us, and I really hope you join us for the next one. So, take care, everybody. Bye for now. Resistance, Divided Elements Number 1 by Michaela Kopievsky. Resistance is the evocative cry of the heterodoxy in this brilliant dystopian story. Set in the walled city-state of future Paris is the new world order of orthodoxy. Kopievsky has created a stark, sharp and complex society with four neurosocial classes. This unique concept of the divided elements is well contrived and delivered seamlessly throughout the book. The world building is clear, the politics, the power plays, economics, cuisine, social settings, all effortlessly slide into place around the well-drawn characters. Initially, I found it challenging to be only behind the eyes and mind of Anya, but I like the thread of her staccato rhythm as a fire elemental, then the softer, more fluid air elemental thinking. This is not a standard dystopian exploration of a reimagined society. It's dark, clever, compelling and thought-provoking. A great read. Let's meet again. Magic happens. Australian Book Lovers acknowledges First Nations peoples and recognises their continuous connection to country, community and to culture. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and honour the sharing of traditional stories passed down through generations. We're committed to a safe and inclusive welcome for authors and readers of all cultures and backgrounds, including people of LGBTQIA communities and their families.